Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to FO256, Defining Digital Assets. My name is David Ainge, and I am your host. Over six months ago, we hosted the first FO256 with a similar ethos to bring institutional caliber investors, family offices, high net worth individuals, and institutions together with the best and most accomplished investors, practitioners, and founders in crypto assets to help bridge the education gap that is evident today. Many on the institutional side have lots of questions, concerns, and doubts about the validity of cryptocurrency and the technological revolution associated with the underlying technology in blockchain. Those who have spent months and years researching it, investing in it, and taking regularly, talking regularly with those in the burgeoning community see the spectacular promise of it. However, understanding it has been plagued with some issues which have delayed more mainstream adoption. Today we continue to provide that education and address those issues. Today we discuss real world use cases for blockchain and digital assets. Real platforms being developed by some of the most talented people from the tech sector and traditional finance sector. Today we hope to empower you with knowledge that leads to more curiosity. You will hear from some of the biggest institutional players in the world who are building in this space. From family offices investing and building around it, from experienced lawyers who are working with state and federal lawmakers on regulatory clarity and guidelines, and from some of the most experienced investors in both public and private markets that have developed. Now, a few administrative issues. First and foremost, I wanted to thank the folks at Rise New York. They have provided the space uh, for us and for this community to gather, so I want to graciously thank them for that. It is a beautiful space. We hosted it last time. Thank you to Rise. <laughs> Secondly, Something that we did last time that I liked and I enjoyed was something that I call that we uh, that is uh, called Slido. Now, if you were here last time, you would you would remember this. But for everyone else, all you need to do is go to slido.com. You don't need to download anything. You can use it on your phone. You can use it on your computer or your smart device. And all you need to do at the very top, it will ask you for a code, and that code is V three two eight. What you will be able to do here is submit questions in real time. And so when anyone's talking and you have questions, you can send it right from your phone or from your smart device and you can, the crowd can upvote and see which ones will be asked to the panel. Additionally, I have a few questions and some things that would be helpful to gain uh, uh, some more education on in terms of your exposure, your interest level in the space. So everyone, as I said, on your phone or on your smart device, all you have to do is go to slido.com and enter in that V328 passcode. Third, we are enabling those in the family office and high net worth community who have not experienced Bitcoin today with a special offering. I want Michael and Kelly from CASA, please if you can stand up. They have graciously uh, offered to donate Bitcoin to anyone who has not had that before. It's a great way to really understand what's happening in the ecosystem, to experience it in real time, and uh, you start to you know, send and transfer and do all sorts of things with it instead of talking about it academically. So please, during breaks, find uh, Michael and Kelly. They will be able to give you some Bitcoin and you'll be able to see how it works. Thank you, CASA. And with that, I want to introduce our first pre presenter, Gabor, who is the Director of Digital Assets and Strategy at VanEck. Gabor will be presenting a macro, top-down view of what's happening within the industry, giving you some precedence and some history on that right now. And so with that, thank you, Gabor, please come up. So I can take questions like, you know, real old school questions as well. You don't have to put it on, on, the, on the slide at the end, so that would be okay. Um, thanks again for the invite, and it's really nice to be talking with family offices. I generally talk with larger institutions, and uh, glad to be here. So first, uh, we're we're going to go, go through woo, uh, basically a little bit of history about Vanek and what we do. Uh, 
how to then how to think about digital assets and some mental models and what allocations uh, you should con consider as a family office. And then I'm going to walk you through uh, through a, what I find an invigorating list of tweets that uh, mostly from me that uh, are basically highlighting the infrastructure developments uh, in the digital asset space. Um, to start with quickly, uh, my, my bias is Bitcoin, um, and just, just so that you know, uh, my background is uh, in uh, basically Bitcoin and ETFs. Uh, I work at VanEck for the past five years. Previously, I was at the PM team, uh, the product management team, and I, I head up uh, the, uh, the, the teams, basically VanEck's uh, digital asset work. Uh, the interesting thing about VanEck is uh, it's, it's a company that was built in 1955, and uh, what we say is that we like to offer, we offer forward-looking and intelligently designed strategies. The firm is a private firm, it's independent, and it focuses on inside execution accessibility and accessibility. Uh, as you uh, may know, uh, VanEck was uh, the first company to build a gold equity fund uh, in the United States. It's, it's one of the reasons uh, why we got involved in Bitcoin as a firm. The 1955 is when the uh, firm was built, and in 68, uh, we built the first gold fund. Uh, the Bitcoin box in the room, uh, John Vanek, uh, the firm's founder, was actually a direct student of Ludwig von Mises, uh, who is uh, basically the, uh, an Austrian economist who believed in hard money. It's money that is backed by something, and at that, at that point it was gold. Uh, in the 1920s, uh, gold was an asset that couldn't be purchased, <laughs> and uh, in the uh, 1950s, 1960s, when uh, Mr. Vanek started looking at it, people thought that he was crazy. Uh, and it was looking at gold in the 1960s, it was like looking at Bitcoin uh, in basically 2010 or 2011. That would be the analogy. And then in 68, after roughly uh, four years of work, we built the first gold fund. And since then, we, we built various strategies, uh, and mostly in the ETF space. Uh, the, there are some more updated numbers. We manage about $50 million, and right now our employees is about uh, 330 in uh, everywhere, pretty much uh, Australia, China, Germany, Switzerland, and uh, we bought 10 ETFs in Amsterdam, which is a really cool and uh, ETF shop. Okay, so that's about Vanek. Uh, for you in the room, if you think about investing in digital assets, I urge you to know the three types of digital assets out there, and those are cryptocurrencies, platforms, and applications. Uh, cryptocurrencies are basically like digital gold or Bitcoin. And it's important to know uh, that they're used uh, to transact value, but not all of them are e effective to do that. And then there are platforms, and most of the, actually, um, the ones that are competing with Bitcoin are platforms. So those are FAT protocols, what we call them. And there are applications which are very specific to, to carry out one thing, like allocate Wi-Fi bandwidth, Internet of Things, devices, and, and th things like that. So cryptocurrencies, platforms, and applications are the three areas that you should keep in mind as you invest. The, when you invest, and um, people will probably <laughs> tell you otherwise uh, in the following panels, but I urge you to only invest about half a percent to a percent of your portfolio maximum. That's our firm view. Uh, it's, these are very early stage assets, and the, your asset allocation bucket is either early venture investing uh, or your store of, uh, or your basically store of value category, which could be uh, gold's competitor. But half a percent to a percent is what we would say, you know, consider maximum. Don't mortgage the house, don't invest 10, 20 percent, don't take out loans or all that. Um, and you'll see in the, the subsequent presentation what one percent of us to your portfolio. I think is boring, so I didn't include that. Um, digital asset markets are sort of uh, growing up uh, right now, but uh, the three major issues that uh, I like to focus on is that it's really hard to know what's the price of Bitcoin. <laughs> it's not as easy as, as you might think uh, for, you know, basically it's easy for securities and, and there's reg NMS in the US. There's no such thing for crypto. It's different by jurisdiction. The ecosystem is fragmented. And there are these things called forks, which is basically a new type of corporate action that often ruins values. <laughs> Uh, for digital assets, and uh, the, the third thing that I focus on is custody. Uh, the 
you, you'll hear some custodians in the room, but I think the, the, the custody ecosystem is not yet in place uh, to, to support mainstream of digital assets. Okay, so um, you should know the rest. There's a lot of uh, hacking, unintentional coding errors, governance is not great. Uh, maybe uh, miners can run a, ruin the system. There are encryption issues. Uh, quantum computers might be able to uh, hack uh, some of the uh, encryption algorithms that are in place today for Bitcoin and other digital assets. So those are all issues that you should be aware of. These, you guys probably know at this point, but this is a snapshot of the crypto compare website. I don't use CoinMarketCap, that's in the news a lot because it's not good data. Uh, I work with the crypto compare guys for about three years now, but are a fully regulated index provider to bring transparency to pricing uh, of digital assets. And the numbers that you see there in the crypto compare and the Vanex Envis site, which I'll show later, is are basically uh, financial standard and definitely not CoinMarketCap level. <laughs> Um, performance, you, you see a lot of, so, oh, Bitcoin lost 80% value and so on. If you look at just um, zoom out year to date, uh, most digital assets, the top ones are up roughly 25 to 50%, some even 100%. In, th in the past three years, most digital assets are up between 1,000 and 5,000%. And then basically in the last six months to a year, you have seen a correction in the 20 to um, 50 percent range, roughly, uh, for digital assets, and one year one year is basically 20 to 70. Uh, but that's the short term. I, I want you to remember the long term. Now, uh, when you hear stories that Bitcoin is owned by uh, only a you know a few people, if you if you look at these lines, that are there big whales? So, oops. Um, basically, there's about um, 15,000 people who own 62% of all Bitcoins. Uh, that's actually fairly well distributed. The, the world's billionaires, 4,500 of them, uh, own about 83% of total wealth. So if you just look at it uh, linearly, right, Bitcoin is four times uh, more sort of like well distributed than wealth is uh, in general. And then these, these are the platforms that you should be aware of. Uh, Bitcoin trading wise, you might ask, is trading Bitcoin legal at all? It is actually. And uh, in the US, it's defined as a commodity. Uh, in a lot of places, it's defined as a virtual currency. Japan made Bitcoin um, legal tender. So if you go to Japan and you would like to pay with Bitcoin and, and the merchant is able to accept Bitcoin, they can't reject it. I think that's a big deal. Uh, but basically, the uh, you probably you should know that Bitcoin is not banned around the world. It's just the definitions of Bitcoin that uh, have changed over time. Okay. So and now I'm going to just go to the segment what has taken place uh, in the Bitcoin markets and why we should look at it as as a legitimate and and quickly uh, growing market. So first of all, I just wanted to let you know that not everyone likes the dollar. I traveled a lot, I was born in Hungary, raised in Germany, and there's a recent sort of uh, rebellion against the US dollar globally. And it's the Walker Rule tried to uh, fix the status of the US dollar. The recent sort of uh, developments in our international relations didn't help. So just keep that in mind. The dollar might, have, might be in trouble. Uh, then Millennials grew up with tokens and digital assets. My brother and I, I used to run a bank in World of Warcraft uh, in, in Stormwind City. And, and it, was, it was actually a fairly good deal. We realized that uh, around uh, four or five o'clock when students come home, uh, they, they would buy different weapons. And, and so we, we traded tokens for real, uh, sort of like uh, gold tokens in Warcraft. And then uh, we paid our memberships and got real dollars out of it. That was more than 10 years ago. <laughs> and before Bitcoin, pretty much. Uh, so my, even my generation, I'm about to turn 30, uh, grew up with tokens. The newer, newer generation is completely in the token world, yet our financial system doesn't interact with this generation. I think it's very important. And all this, uh, and so, so that's, one, that's one aspect. And the second aspect is there are a lot of centralized uh, failures that we, uh, that we experienced across the board, like Aquifax hack, uh, different exchange just being hacked, countries being hacked. It's all because there's a central point of failure. Uh, distributed ledgers, which uh, 
basically may be able to uh, disrupt these systemic issues and may be crucial to our national security as well. And we'll see that playing out in probably 10 years. All right, so the cool tweets now. There's groups um, like you know, Goldman, NASDAQ, VanEck, Fidelity, uh, BACT, the CME group. There's so much going on in this space. Real institutions are participating. It's not just the family offices. Um, Wall Street will have a role in, in crypto. We have seen a lot of market structure uh, development, and I think the next three years, we'll see that crypto will actually grow more on Wall Street than anywhere else. And uh, you shouldn't overlook it. So we, um, we're we sort of um, leading the efforts on building uh, a Bitcoin ETF and other regulated instruments, as you likely have seen in the news. Uh, hopefully, we'll get this ETF approved. I don't have a timeline for you. I can tell you to uh, the uh, outside of the ETF to keep your ears open, uh, because you may hear from us. We're, we're building uh, a number of other uh, regulated structures that might be actually of interest for this group. And we can talk about that later. Um, so, yeah, I, I lost about two inches of hair uh, to uh, regulators uh, and, and my work to get an ETF approved. And I hope that you are going to help me at some point uh, to, to get an ETF to, to market and you, you'll be a client of ours. Um, we have received the most number of comments in the history of the SEC for any fund. It was 1,600 comments. And this was about nine times as many comments as the second uh, <laughs> uh, ETF uh, proposal got. So there's a lot of public support, and, and we really appreciate that. Um, there's surveillance uh, coming to market. Uh, we announced last year that with NASDAQ that we are going to bring surveilled futures uh, to the market. So some of the underlying uh, spot markets, the crypto exchanges that you don't trust today, uh, are getting surveilled. And, uh, I think that's an important step. So information sharing, know who's trading on those exchanges, no funky business. And it needs to sort of happen before uh, the regulated product comes to market. Uh, Envis, our um, index provider in, in Germany with Crypto Compare, built ISCO compliance and actually uh, under SEC exemption and, and EU benchmark law uh, compliant indices for crypto two, three years ago roughly. Uh, and so there's a way to monitor for funds at proper price of uh, digital assets. Uh, we have also provided the index for the first uh, multi-asset ETP in Switzerland, uh, the Amun product, as you may have heard of it. So Switzerland, actually, and, uh, and Sweden are <laughs> ahead of the curve and ahead of the US for regulated products. And, uh, and so we are, we are hoping that eventually we'll catch up. But uh, Switzerland is a small market, so we didn't want to participate there, but we helped another provider get to market. Uh, and I, I think it's an important step. We also built transparency to do over-the-counter uh, markets, uh, which I think people underestimate, but about uh, some, somewhere between 35 to 60 percent of the, the volume of Bitcoin, that's actual volume is trading over-the-counter. That's what our ETF is tracking, working with the, the largest uh, and most regulated traders in the uh, over-the-counter space. And then. Uh, there was a Bitcoin celebration, a 10-year birthday celebration, in the U.S. in a major television show, which is, I just thought that was crazy. Like, I never thought that that, that, that will happen, that a major news channel will, will um, cover Bitcoin. And guess what happened? Uh, our, our dear president throughout my session. And it was very uncomfortable, to, to say the least. Um, all right, so uh, I have a few more things. I don't know how much time I have left. Probably. 10 more minutes, okay. Uh, so I do a lot of surveys um, on, on Twitter, and I urge you to follow me on Twitter and add me on LinkedIn if you don't get to catch up. Uh, and one of the surveys uh, said, so I ask people that, um, what type of assets do you plan to own in the future besides Bitcoin and digital assets? And most people said it's you know, gold, uh, emerging, uh, emerging markets, and, and some uh, broad and diversified market. And, I can retweet this, but the, in the comments section, there's a lot of real estate, there's a lot of tokenized securities, and and, and, and it was just very interesting to me. The, the kind of people who engage in this space are generally interested in gold and emerging markets. Uh, so that's kind of the, the more forward-looking international and the sort of uh, value type of space that engages with uh, digital assets. Um, this one is... Uh, <laughs> 
I don't know how accurate this one is, but uh, <laughs> I got a lot of comments uh, for this. It might, might have been uh, an army that held out that would. Uh, so basically, people are looking at um, you know other digital assets as well, and XRP and ETH is one of them. But I think some of those may be a thing of the past uh, once tokenized securities come to market. Um, I'm a big fan of stable coins, uh, as in not, not the ones generally that are in market, but the first one, Tether. Uh, Tether has significantly increased the speed of the US dollar, and crypto was pretty much unbanked. Uh, and when crypto was un unbanked, this thing has created banking for crypto and crypto exchanges. Couple upgraded the US dollar. Why don't we give the audience a kind of one-on-one of what a stablecoin is? Okay. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So a stablecoin is basically the um, the it's it's like your US dollar. Uh, it, it's the idea is that Bitcoin is volatile and some of the digital assets have higher volatility than traditional assets, like three times higher volatility. And so you want if uh, in order for a digital asset or a cryptocurrency to be effect, efficient you'd want their, its price to be stable, so uh, you can create different mechanisms to keep it that way. And basically, Tether, which is USDT, is, is tethered or tied to the price of US dollar. So when, when you redeem Tether, it's about one-to-one uh, -one relationship with USD, and basically, you can get move significant chunks of money without having to touch US dollars. So it was a big improvement for those crypto exchanges that did not have banking relationships. And it, is, it was a sign how the financial system and banking failed and crypto innovated. And that's, that, that, was, that was a very important step to me. Today, Tether still banks about two billion uh, dollars worth of assets. Um, yes, so that's, I mean, I have one more slide. I think it's in my conservative estimate uh, for the, the next uh, 20 years, roughly. Uh, I think digital assets will be uh, above 10 trillion dollars. Right now, ETF sit, ETF sits around 6.87 trillion. That market came about in 20 years, roughly. Um, given the breadth of uh, of uh, things that, that digital assets and tokens can access, and the uh, just a general promise of having Bitcoin as a non-sovereign non issued, uh, trust minimized, sound money, I think will. Uh, We'll see uh, a lot of assets flowing into this industry, and I could be, you know, off by an order of magnitude. I don't know either side, but I, again, I think this is a space that you should keep in mind. And before we open up to questions, I, I just urge you to do your due diligence very similarly about the space as you do uh, for other asset classes. Demand, demand regulated institutions. Demand basically what you would demand from any other assets, uh, else uh, you might get burnt. <laughs> And that's my uh, sort of uh, final word. L let me know if I can be of help. I'm on LinkedIn and, and I, I'm fairly active on Twitter, as some people know in the room. Uh, we do have a question. Yes. You guys are using it. Thank you. Um, so a question just came in. Now, obviously, you are not someone that can necessarily pontificate about why things happen within Bitcoin, but there was a lot of speculation on why the recent run-up has happened. Uh, we crossed over 5,000 recently uh, over the last week. So in your opinion, Van Eck, what are the things that are you're seeing that might have caused the recent rally within Bitcoin? And where do you, if you could, if there is any kind of you know relative forecast or projection that you are more akin to, where do you see it, you know, Bitcoin happening within the next, uh, pricing out in the next 12 months? So first, price is not the most important thing to watch. I think it's the, the, the structural transformation that's taking place and, and how the financial system gets disintermediated. That's more important. But on the, on the recent price jump, uh, it's a much less sexy answer than you accept, uh, expect what happened. So um, and, at the, and the last Friday, <laughs> people say that there's a mystery buyer. Someone is buying. I don't believe that's true. So on the last Friday of uh, every month at, uh, I think it's 4 p.m. London time, or 3 p.m. London time, the CME Bitcoin futures expire, which was uh, new in New York time. Uh, a lot of the, basically we were around that time, we were at uh, 4,000, 3,980. Uh, then uh, the front contracts got rolled into the new front month contract. Uh, there was some buying, price went up to 4,050, 
their subsequent buying over the weekend price went to four thousand one hundred fifty three million dollars of shorts were liquidated and leveraged trading platforms and we went through a short squeeze and from between four thousand two hundred and four thousand nine hundred the order books were pretty much they were super thin and the price ran up very quickly as about 12 to 13 million dollars arbitrage between exchanges so it was a short squeeze induced rally and where Bitcoin goes, uh, I, I'm, I'm not in a position to comment, but I think there's a lot to look forward to if there are things like ETFs come to market. Another, another question just came in. Do you think digital assets are perceived as a risk on or risk off asset now? And how would you change, how would that change in the context of a future recession? So uh, we like to say at Vanek, and, and this is uh, Jan Vanek, our CEO, I bor borrowed this term uh, from him. He says that uh, Bitcoin today acts about basically two-thirds as a tax stock and one-third as gold. And that's the sort of the, the correlation that we have observed over time. Uh, a lot of the buyers are tech-oriented people, so Bitcoin tends to trade with uh, sometimes, uh, especially during rallies, uh, following tech stocks in the market and sometimes act as gold. I think longer term, it will be more like a sort of like a gold type uh, safe haven asset. So move uh, against the, the diff different direction compared to the market. So basically against the market. How would you expect digital assets to perform in a case of global recession? You guys are really draconian out here right now. God. Bitcoin will go to the moon. And, no, I, uh, it's, so the, uh, I think it will actually, people will re-explore gold and, and Bitcoin. So about 0.7% of uh, any managed portfolios in the world own gold. That's very small. And gold is about $7.8 trillion in outstanding value. I think in the next global recession, people will re-explore gold and Bitcoin. Uh, and what's the price impact? If there's a lot of buying, I think the price is going to go up, but I don't know how much. I, I think there's definitely going to be new investors looking for um, at basically risk, risk assets that are um, move against the market like gold. Okay, one more unfair question. Your comment on Tether leans positive. I don't know if you want to say that, but okay. Please comment on Tether's unaudited, unredeemable characteristics and what risks might exit exist from that non-transparency? So, um, I'm, <laughs> this is Gabor, not Vanek. Uh, the, I think the, the Tether guys have not failed anyone yet. Uh, and they, so they managed two uh, billion dollars. They have a banking relationship. Uh, they don't have a quote traditional audit because American firms actually can audit them technically, and the this is this is this is important. If you're in the crypto business, and if you're a crypto firm doing business, you have no access to banking. You have no access to auditing. Uh, most of the services will turn your back to you. The very basic things that we get done in financial services are unaccessible. It's ridiculously that it's ten times harder or more to do business with crypto. And they've managed to find a bank. They managed to satisfy redemptions. I think they are doing a good job. Uh, some of the crypto businesses, if regulators were friendlier and more clear with their guidance, would actually come out and would want to work in, in getting a bank. You know that, like you know, Wells Fargo, which was their partner, right? Uh, in in, 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 the, in Taiwan, and they cut them off. Literally, the bank cut their lines off and they couldn't uh, redeem money for their clients, not because of them, but because of the bank. So that, that's a team that I've been uh, seeing that regulators are not, not giving guidance to this space. And in fact, actually, industry is driving it against a regulatory push. With the NASDAQ future slide that I showed, there's a number of crypto trading platforms or exchanges that are properly licensed that actually want to come fully in the green and in the US, and that's actually a very positive market development. I, I think actually some of these exchanges in the next two years will probably run a securities trading platform and become fully licensed exchanges. That's, that's my thought about that. And with that, Gabor, thank you very much. Everyone, thank you. Thank you.